Hey everybody, thanks for jumping on our webinar, the Healthcare and Power of Procurement Antibiotic Stewardship in Agriculture. So I'm very excited for this uh, session, especially given the great panels that we have. Uh, I'm gonna introduce myself really quickly. I'll probably cough several times throughout this because I'm getting over um, a, a very bad cold, not COVID, but a very bad cold. Um, so apologies for that. And then I will turn it over to our speakers and we will have plenty of time uh, for Q&A as well. So my name is Matt Wellington. I'm the Public Health Campaigns Director for U.S. Berg Education Fund, and I'm your moderator for today's event. Uh, and I want to first off thank our, our co-hosts, the Infectious Disease Department at the Washington University School of Medicine and uh, the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. So uh, we are here today to talk about the power of procurement for healthcare institutions. And that covers hospitals, but also medical schools, public health schools, uh, any institution that deals with health that also serves food to the people that the institution services, whether that's patients or staff or students. Uh, and we're gonna talk today about antibiotic resistance uh, as a major public health threat, the role that the food system plays in that public health problem, and then how healthcare institutions can play a significant role in helping to, to solve it by using their institutional purchasing power. So uh, let me quickly introduce our speakers and then I'll turn it over to them so that you don't have to hear me cough uh, any more than I will probably do now. Um, so first off, we have Dr. Sena Sayud, uh, who's an infectious disease specialist at Washington University School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Sayud. Uh, we have Kathy Lawrence from the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. We have John Stoddard from Healthcare Without Harm and Talin Metjian. Did I get that right? Awesome. From the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So each of our speakers are going to spend about five minutes giving a quick opening presentation about their perspective or role on this issue, which will range from kind of big picture, but then also get to some of the nuts and bolts of how to actually get your institution to change their purchasing practices uh, and, and with a case study um, from from Talene about how CHOP was able to successfully do this, which I'm excited to hear about. Uh, so five minutes or so per speaker, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. And first, I'm going to pass it to Dr. Sayud. All right, so uh, everyone can hear me and see my slides. Good. Okay. Um, so my name is Senna. I'm one of the infectious diseases doctors at WashU in St. Louis, and I'm part of the antimicrobial stewardship program at Barnes Jewish Hospital, which is our flagship hospital here. Um, it's which is about 1,400 beds, and I'm just going to give sort of a brief background um, about the topic at hand today, which I think is broadly how we can have a bigger impact on stewardship outside the walls of our hospitals and clinics. Um, so I've got no financial disclosures, and I'm very passionate about antibiotic stewardship because antibiotic use is necessary, but it's also what drives development and resistance, uh, spread of resistant infections. Um, my decision to give an antibiotic to a patient isn't isolated to uh, me and the patient. It's a decision that has consequences that sort of reverberate across the planet. It drives my, the dispensation of the antibiotic, drives hospital purchasing, which in turn drives production. Um, the residues at the site of production get into the environment there uh, and ca cause selection of resistance in the environment, which then affects the people who live in that environment. So this is how the New Delhi metallo beta lactamase developed in India. Um, looking in the other, other direction, um, the antibiotic affects the gut microbiome of my patient who goes home to their family, um, and we know that household contacts will eventually um, sort of have similar gut microbiota, so those resistance genes will transfer from person to person, which is then through sort of communal resources, especially the water supply will transmit throughout the community. And we all live on the same planet. So once these resistance genes are out there, they're out there. So the single decision connected me to my patient, to their community, to communities across the world. Um, we do antibiotic stewardship in the hospital because it has an impact, but really it's a minority of antibiotic use in humans. So we've expanded sort of our reach to the outpatient setting. But when you look at it in context, um, it's still not enough. So there's about 3 million kilograms of antibiotics used yearly in the US on humans, 
but in animals that number is 10.5 million kilograms, um, so over three times the amount. And although this number in the US is decreasing, it's sort of plateaued in recent years. Since about 2018, there hasn't been much of a change. Um, and globally, the number is still increasing. The antibiotics that are used uh, in animal agriculture are really important ones, so in including macrolides, aminoglycosides, penicillins, cephalosporins, um, tetracyclines, and sulfonamides, um, as well uh, and, and quinolones, uh, particularly concerning. And they're very easy to get. This is just a screenshot from tractorsupply.com where I just searched antibiotic, and this is the first line of the first page of results. And there's two formulations of parenteral tetracycline as well as parenteral penicillin that you can just go ahead and get. Um, so why are antibiotics used in food production? And the, the short answer is that is because we need antibiotics in food production to produce at the volume that we're producing. Um, you can see here the trend of meat consumption and production over the last 50 years, which has far outstripped sort of human population growth. And the only way to produce this volume of meat is to concentrate animals into what you know we call factory farms or concentrated animal feed operations. When you concentrate animals in this way, uh, this increases the likelihood of infection because these are highly stressful environments, and as well as the likelihood of outbreaks because just because of the physical proximity to each other and to, the, and to their wastes, basically. So antibiotics are used, um, uh, so it, these animals get a lot of infections, so antibiotics are used in their treatment, but they're also used in metaphylaxis, which is the treatment of healthy animals who have uh, contact with a sick animal, as well as prophylaxis, especially early in their life cycles, to prevent outbreaks. Um, and antibiotics are used across pretty much any animal product you can think of, including dairy and aquaculture. Um, so, so the this obviously has um, sort of ethical and environmental considerations and animal welfare considerations, but we're going to take a very narrow view and uh, kind of a selfish view and look at simply the implications for human health uh, alone. And the, the dynamics I mentioned in my first slide that apply to humans apply to animals broadly as well, and in fact, even, even more so. So looking at antibiotic resistance genes and uh, waste products, you can see this is a log scale here. So you can see the concentration is much higher in livestock waste as opposed to hu uh, human uh, waste and municipal waste. Um, these uh, resistance genes don't just stay in that waste. Uh, these these uh, the resistance genes in the bacteria themselves travel through the surface water, soil, and groundwater, and they interact with other bacteria. And through the magic of horizontal gene transfer, they these resistance genes will transmit among species. And eventually, these bacteria that now har harbor these new antibiotic resistance genes that came from food production will end up in the human microbiome. Um, and that's the human sort of gut microbiome or the human microbiome, either the skin or gut or respiratory system is where we actually get a lot of our bacterial infections. So these will eventually cause clinically significant infection, um, which are difficult to treat, um, even in a person who's never been directly exposed to antibiotics. Um, this is already, this isn't just a theoretical risk. This has already been observed in humans for a very long time, for many decades. So a famous example was in East Germany, where uh, a type of e uh, resistance gene uh, that was initially essentially non-existent was first uh, seen after the introduction of this antibiotic called nursothricin in animal agriculture, first seen in the animals, then in the farm workers, and finally causing infection in people in the surrounding communities. Same thing was seen in the U.S. as literally as the 70s, and more recently, MRSA has been linked to um, the production of pork uh, in these concentrated animal feed operations. Pork farmers and pork producers are much more likely to be colonized with these infections with MRSA, and there are much higher rates of uh, MRSA. RSA infections in the communities surrounding these. MCR1, which is a mobile uh, gene that encodes colistin resistance, is a direct result of colistin use in pork production in China. And obviously, you can get resistant infections just from uh, foodborne pathogens if the reservoir, which is animals, um, is selected, if you select for resistance bugs in Campylobacter and Salmonella, for example, and just get a direct infection from those. So, what's for us, what can we do about this? And really, we sort of have to expand our horizon of what stewardship means to us. Hospitals, so when we do antibiotic stewardship in the hospital, in the end, fundamentally, it's about influencing what, what antibiotics are purchased and 
you know, more upstream produced, because this has direct implications not only for individual patient health, but for the health of the community and the planet as a whole. So hospitals, when the, while they take care of patients, also purchase food. And as we've seen from the previous slide, have the exact same implications because of how our food sort of system is structured. Um, so personally, I've expanded my personal stewardship efforts to start these conversations with our hospital um, uh, ca cafeteria and food purchasers. And I'm learning about sort of the complexities of these conversations. And I'll allow uh, Kathy Lawrence to continue sort of the description of those complexities. These are my references, just in case anybody wants them. I'll highlight this paper in particular is I found to be very uh, useful. Yeah, that um, that graphic, I, I can't remember what you called it, and I'm not a technical person, but where you showed the genes in the waste, I'd never seen that before. That was really interesting. Yes, and that is, sorry, I'll highlight that paper if I can go back. That is this paper right here. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Sayud. I have several questions for you, um, but I'll, I'll hold on to those for now. So we're going to turn it over to Kathy Lawrence uh, to give us a big picture on just institutional purchasing and, and what you need to consider for that. So um, let me pull up your slides, Kathy. Thank you, Matt. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Kathy Lawrence, I advise the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center at George Washington University in our accountability and antibiotics project, as well as our certified responsible antibiotic use standards and labels uh, slide. Um, as you can see, our central mission at the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center is to bring together epidemiologists, microbiologists, communications experts, policy experts, to really work on how to curb the superbugs and to protect antibiotics. Um, ARAC also works on market-based ways to reduce antibiotic use in animal agriculture. And we have learned a lot and I think contributed a lot to build the power of procurement, especially in institutional purchasing settings. So I began working with this great team of folks back in, I think, 2012, uh, before ARAC was uh, created. And we were working with very large public school systems in the US uh, feeding between 40,000 and a million meals a day and trying to help them uh, procure and serve food that was more healthful, more regionally sourced, more sustainably produced within the budget that they had at that time, which was about $1.25 for school lunch. And chicken is the number one protein served in schools. They really wanted to get away from the extruded product to real chicken raised without antibiotics at that time. Um, the supply was very limited and the price point was completely impossible. And that led us down the path uh, to create the Certified Responsible Antibiotic Use Standard uh, and to work with USDA to get that third party verified. Uh, so new and new noteworthy is that um, we've moved on from poultry, which was uh, initially adopted by Tyson and then P Purdue and other large uh, chicken and turkey producers like Cargill. And we're now expanding into all markets and uh, working to secure our first beef and pork adopters. So stay tuned on that. We're excited about it. Just want to say a couple of things as you embark on your uh, institutional procurement change strategy that it, it's really all about supply and demand. And at the pioneering edge of procurement change, supply and demand are almost never uh, well matched. And in the arena of antibiotic resistance and reducing antibiotics in animal agriculture, um, it's most often that the demand outstrips the supply. So it takes time and real effort on both sides to sort of get that into a better balance. Um, any change to production practices, especially the kind of systemic changes that are required to reduce or even eliminate antibiotic use, those things cost money. Um, the producer, you know, whether it's reducing the stocking density and providing more space or better feed or better ventilation or lighting or other environmental enhancements or alternative treatments, or even going all the way upstream to the breeding stock to make sure that they are healthy and strong. All of that costs money. 
And so uh, next slide, as uh, the Beatles have wisely told us, uh, it is a long and winding road. Uh, and it's really important to sort of pace yourself uh, and set realistic expectations from the outset. It really doesn't happen overnight. So I think it's a really good practice to just uh, try to work from small initial successes towards the vast systems changes that we all know we need to make. Um, so for the producers to shift their production practices and their animal husbandry in very significant ways and to take on that cost, they need to do that with some sort of security, if not a guarantee, that there is actual demand and a commitment to purchase. And they want to make sure that it's going to be for the long haul and not just a one-off. Uh, so on the institutional side, whether that's hospitals and health care systems, Systems or other institutions, it's really important to think through what it takes to make that kind of commitment. Um, and I have always found just starting with questions is a really good place, whether it's within your internal working situation, with your suppliers, with producers themselves. But big, broad, open-ended questions tend to open up the dialogue rather than shut it down, rather than a demand of, we want this and you need to provide it to us. So thinking about where where are we now, where do we want to be, why um, are we doing this, and what do we want our world to look like sort of allows to allows the shared values and the shared goals to emerge early in the process. And once you've got that shared vision in the long term, then you can step back and say, okay, these are the incremental goals that are going to get us there. And it doesn't have to be smart goals, although I like the specific measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. I think that's a, a really nice model. But it's more thinking about what does it take for each link in the chain, who needs to be at the table, and when. And and so in the hospital and healthcare system, I think that it, depending on your purchasing structure, of course, where you start will be different. If you're working with a management company, then you have to start with the contract terms and the duration. Do you have any built-in flexibility? How much is that? How can you maximize it? If the contract is coming up for renewal sometime soon or a year or two from now, you have time to set your goals and get your demand figures together and get those into the conversation early on. If you're self-op, it means looking at your procurement policies and your bid specifications. So again, it's not just a one-off purchase, but really an institutionalization of your goals through procurement to reduce animal um, agriculture antibiotic use. Um, no matter what your purchasing structure is, I think a very early important goal is to quantify your demand. That's where the suppliers or the contractor or the management company or the producer is going to start. What What's the demand? What's the potential dollar value of this business to even have the conversation? Um, and I would say that just to ease the work along the way, collaboration is essential. Um, next slide. And I think that's both internal to your institution and then with your external partners. A lot of really good work has been done in various sectors. I, I hope that will be covered in some detail uh, soon in this webinar. Um, but there are, are approaches out there. There are templates th that you can be adapting rather than trying to create from scratch. One particular uh, collaboration that I want to highlight, and I'm hoping John will talk more about it in just a few minutes, is Anchors in Action. Uh, and this alliance is really the first of its kind. Uh, slide, please. And it is national, it's cross-sector, it's a partnership among healthcare, K-12, higher ed, government institutions, and it's sort of aggregating the demand from a single institution to an entire sector to this multi-sector national effort. And they've been working to align their procurement standards, their food procurement standards across sectors to create bigger demand to be able to push the somewhat and sometimes intractable supply chain. Um, so I would su strongly suggest that you plug in with them. And just in closing, I would say stay connected. Um, we at the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center, slide please, uh, are really ready and willing to work with you and uh, look forward to hearing about your future successes. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, let's
turn it over to John, who I think is going to go more in detail around hospital uh, procurement. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, everyone. And Kathy, um, I think I'm going to cover some similar um, topics in a different way. But uh, to get us started, I am John Stoddard. I'm based in Boston. I'm the uh, Associate Director of Food and Climate Strategy for Healthcare Without Harm. And a little bit about us, we were founded over 25 years ago. And our mission is to transform healthcare worldwide so that it reduces its environmental footprint, becomes a community anchor for sustainability, and a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. Our Healthy Food and Healthcare program was launched in 2005 and works to harness the expertise, purchasing power, and investments of the healthcare sector to advance the development of a sustainable, equitable food system. Our work is really, um, the foundation of our work is, is environmental. It's the concept of environmental nutrition, which holds that healthy food cannot be defined by nutritional quality alone. It is the end result of a food system that conserves and renews natural resources, advances social justice and animal welfare, builds community wealth, and fulfills the food and nutrition needs of all eaters now and into the future. And as Kathy mentioned, um, Kathy, I unfortunately do not have slides on Anchor in Action, but happy to answer questions on that. Um, but this really, you know, what environmental nutrition really encompasses some of the, um, the principles behind Anchor in Action, because we're looking at all different aspects of the food system and developing standards to ensure that, um, you know, there are, are good working conditions, um, the food is environmentally um, sustainably produced, um, including um, the issue of antibiotics. So um, Matt today asked me to go over basically the 101 of healthcare food purchasing and Kathy touched on a couple aspects of it. I, I might add a, a bit to what she said. Um, and then some of the, um, I, and I'll just finish off by, by talking about a few of the resources we have um, specific to, to this issue um, and ways that you could take action within your own facility and community. Um, so getting us started here on food, uh, food purchasing 101 healthcare. Um, so Kathy did touch on this a bit, but there's kind of two types of food service, um, two general types. So self-op or in-house management, that is when the hospital is um, essentially, you know, the, the people working in the cafeterias, the chefs, the, the front of house folks are all employees of the hospital. Um, food service director, you know, is an employee of the hospital. Um, and then you have the outsourced or contracted, um, which we call, you know, food service management companies. So whenever you see F FMC on my slide, that's a, a food service management company. Um, those folks, um, you know, basically bring in their own staff. Sometimes it's more than food service. They might run environmental services. Um, if you're working in a hospital and you see, uh, the chef with their chef coats, uh, they often, you know, the, these companies have their own, um, brands on the chef coat. So you might see folks from Aramark or Sodexo or Compass. Um, or Compass's um, subsidiary Morrison. Um, so, you know, that's a good clue that your uh, your facility is food service is, is contracted out. I mentioned these two because generally um, self-operated facilities have a bit more flexibility um, in their purchasing, um, whereas the, the food service management companies um, have less flexibility. That of course will depend on your contract. There's all sorts of different, there's different types of contracts. Um, some with food service man management companies might include um, only the managers in the facility. Um, some might include um, management, but not purchasing. Um, I would say most contain management and purchasing together, um, but you know, it, it varies. So if this is something, um, 
I think it's good information. So if you're if you're looking to take action in your facility, it's good information to know kind of where you're coming from, where food service is coming from. Um, I would also say for in for in terms of the flexibility of purchasing um, in house or or self op um, food service has more flexibility. So as you'll see in the next slide. There will be a cert, you'll you'll sort of be obligated to purchase um, from a certain distributor that you tend to have um, certain obligations around that even as a self op. Um, the management company might even have um, the requirement even down to the product itself. So the specific chicken breast that you buy, um, you know, can be sort of dictated. Um, within that contract, um, or with at least within the operations of the management company. Um, so, for example, if you're if you're a managed facility or a contracted, um, your food service director will have their their part of their performance evaluation will be whether or not they purchase the products that are that are um, basically prioritized by the company. So. Just giving you a sense of the different sort of um, levels of um, what can be complications and levels of flexibility that that different um, hospitals might have depending on how they run their food service. So um, basically, I wanted to go over if if you're a um, I want to go over group purchasing organizations. So most hospitals, um, I know very few incidences of hospitals that are not part of a GPO, but group purchasing organizations, um, most hospitals are members of them. They're obviously, they join them so they can pool their demand um, and achieve better prices. Typically with the GPO, uh, when you sign up and, in, and it includes food purchasing, most often, um, you are required under your contract with them to purchase most of your products from a certain distributor. These would be the, the broad line distributors that you've seen their trucks like, like um, Cisco or US Foods or Performance Food Group. Um, and you will most likely be purchasing 80% of your food um, from those folks. With a food service management company, that number can be a little higher, can be up to 90%. So just giving you a sense here again of sort of where um, how contracts come into play um, and how it really dictates a lot of the food that you see um, in your cafeteria. So these this is kind of a snapshot of the um, the big players here. Um, you can see there has been a lot of consolidation over the years. Um, so, um, we used to have back in the nineties, something like 15 major GPOs. We're now down to about three major GPOs. Uh, it is likely that your hospital is a member of the Zian's premier or health trust. Um, you can see that the same type of consolidation that's happening with food service management companies. Um, so you've got Compass Group, Aramark, and Sodexo as, um, the big three. And we have this graphical depiction here about their influence in, in the market. They're sort of towering over uh, McDonald's here. So you might think, um, you know, I guess there's different ways to interpret this consolidation. Um, one positive aspect of it might be that um, these, if you're a member of these GPOs, um, they might have um, increased power to message over to the um, supply chain about your demands around um, meat raised uh, responsibly. So I wanna end off here um, just with some different actions that you can take. Um, certainly um, uh, the anchors in action that Kathy mentioned, um, we, the three organizations that join together basically are covering healthcare, higher ed, city and, and like municipal purchasing. So we're aligning our, our um, standards so that we can send one consistent measure or, or message to the supply chain. Um, so please do, um, if you're in healthcare, um, we will be rolling out our guidance around that over the next year. 
Um, the standards are done, but it, but each organization is sort of developing their own pathway for the for the folks that they work with. Um, so this will be slowly and progressively reflected in all our materials. Um, you can get in touch with me, uh, or also just sort of, um, you know, go to our website to to, to follow sort of the, the development of uh, of these standards and our support for healthcare and meeting those standards. Um, but really specific to this topic today, we do have some good resources um, and everything in here is a live link. So I'll make sure Matt has these slides and can send them out afterwards. Um, so, you know, first off, I would I would really start if, if um, I don't know everyone that's on this call, but I was told that it's gonna be some clinicians. Um, so using your voice is, is powerful. So we know that, um, Doctors, nurses, PAs, uh, NPs are all all sort of our trusted voices in our communities. So using your voice, either you know, in sort of the legislative process um, or just within your own facility, to talk talk to um, you know management of hospitals on the importance of this issue. And so one thing you can advise for for your um, for your organization is to adopt an antibiotics resolution. Um, and so you can see here on the right under general resources, there's that antibiotic stewardship toolkit. So in there, you're going to find examples from other hospitals, what they've done. You'll find sample language so you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and um, so, so that's, that's one thing. And you can use those resolution in your, in your discussions or contract negotiations with your GPOs, your food service management companies, and other vendors. So that's one thing. Another toolkit we have is, um, under the heading of providers is for incorporating the overuse of antibiotics in agriculture into antibiotic stewardship programs. So if your hospital has a stewardship program, it, it, it's adding um, the elements around um, meat purchases and, and, and purchasing meat, um, uh, you know, responsibly raised meat, um, putting that right into your stewardship program. Um, and then of course, um, I, uh, th I think this was mentioned earlier, but well, um, at the onset, we were talking about how um, antibiotics are used because of the sheer volume of animals that we are producing. So if we were able to um, reduce our demand for animal protein, um, we could encourage um, producers on that side, uh, you know, on the production side to um, be able to encourage and facilitate and enable them to use production systems that are not um, producing at quite the volume. So this is a lot of the work that I do um, with my food and climate focus is um, under food service, you'll see Plant Forward Future. So that is a program where we have all kinds of support for healthcare to implement plant forward menus in their facilities, reducing the demand and the use of animal products um is is an important strategy you could also find the cool food pledge which i help manage hospitals that is a um a climate focused initiative where um hospitals um join an international cross-sector initiative to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from food purchasing it's largely done by um increasing plant forward menu items and reducing um reducing animal proteins so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, sorry about this last slide. You can just ignore that for Madeline's um, um, email. And that's my email there if you want to get in touch with me. So thanks a lot. Thanks, John. I was pretty blown away when you showed that graph of, of Compass's influence in particular compared to McDonald's. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Metjan to talk about CHOP's recent experience uh, adopting a purchasing preference for antibiotics. So. Over to you, and then we'll jump into our Q and A. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, you could just give me a head nod if you could see my slides. All good. Okay, great. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tali Metchin. I'm the manager for the antimicrobial stewardship program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, when we think about antibiotic resistance, we're usually discussing the resistant organisms affecting our patients how to prevent them from spreading and how best to treat them. 
as Dr. Sayud said, um, you know, where do these organisms come from? Um, selection for resistance can be caused by antibiotics prescribed by clinicians, but really we also need to consider the effects of antibiotics that are used outside of clinical medicine. And um, in the United States specifically, about 67% of antibiotics used nationwide are used in agriculture, specifically in food producing animals. So taking inspiration from U.S. PERG and clinician champions in comprehensive antibiotic stewardship, we went on a almost three year journey um, to have CHOP um, endorse the statement. And I wanted to share this process with you of how we got there. Um, the statement um, here um, to summarize, it says, you know, CHOP supports the judicious use of antimicrobials, not only in children and adults, but also food animals where possible. And this statement expresses the institution's commitment and helps us provide leverage um, to partner with food companies as well as contractors. So one of the first steps really was identifying you know, who would be a physician or administrative uh, champion for us. And I was fortunate to have somebody within the Division of Infectious Disease. And next, really the biggest thing was understanding the institutional's um, department structure. Where is food purchased? How is, um, how is it? And who does the purchasing? So as a clinical pharmacist as background, you know, there, these are areas of the institution that I generally do not interact with, but it also gave us a great opportunity to raise awareness um, of antimicrobial stewardship and the work we do in a non-clinical space. And so what we learned was that um, at CHOP, the food services is contracted and falls under the vice president of operations. Also within that um, VP of operations was the nutrition committee, which is a multidisciplinary committee that included members of gastroenterology, general pediatrics, clinical nutrition, and food services. These became kind of our key stakeholders and who were able to get buy-in for um, having such a pledge um, approved and and highlighted from um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So we set up a time and kind of did road shows, you know, got the approval from the nutrition committee. We leveraged our eco health um, committee as well. And um, once we had all that buy-in, we then got our endorsements and we went up through the, our therapeutic standards committee, which other institutions might um, know as P&T um, so that we can get um, the approval. Mentorship really was um, a big thing um, for, for this to happen. I really would be remiss if I didn't um, thank uh, Jen Thorpe, who was the director of clinical nutrition at that time, Matt Wellington here, who is our, um, our representative uh, for US PERC. His advocacy and bringing clinicians together to educate on this issue was vital. Um, Scott Wiseman from Seattle Children's Hospital, who really pioneered hospital commitments to purchasing food from food raised without antibiotics. They all helped me throughout this process. It um, you know, took over three years, things stalled, COVID happened. Um, it wasn't a, um, there was leadership changes throughout the time, but they were there to encourage me to even, um, to even having meetings and being put on agendas were, were considered wins, um, even though I was seeing them as obstacles. But uh, you know, some of the statements they, they would say is, hey, no, that's a win. You're on agendas, people are, are listening um, and you know, we're, we're, we're have some movement. So one of the, um, the biggest partnerships really was our food um, services, that that was essential to this being successful. They facilitated the discussion for us. It's our mark um, is our, I think it was GOP is the GOP or GPO is what, um, um, what John had said um, for, uh, was our chopped food vendor. Um, they have their own commitment. So we really leveraged the commitment they had already signed and agreed to, and then kind of have been pushing them now throughout the process. Um, we also worked with our um, marketing um, who designed these visual um, aids that you see about um, CHOP's commitment. It highlights um, the menu items that we know are antibiotic free. Also um, worked on a QR code so that employees, parents, um, and patients, you know, could click on and, and it provides the why this is important. And these digital signs are throughout um, the cafeteria and other eating areas, as well as um, marked for the stations where those products um, would be made and as well as picked up. 
the work really is, is not done. Um, the next steps for us include a statement um, in the inpatient menus um, about the foods that are antibiotic free. We are um, in the process of also discussing um, with our CHOP outreach, it's called Healthier Together, as well as the Office in Diversity and Inclusion um, to really discuss food sustainability and health disparities. Since, you know, as you heard, purchasing antibiotic free and sustainable food may be cost pr um, prohibitive. And kind of really to not just have a statement, but then use it for, you know, we also contract, you know, um, host different vendors to come in to say, um, to hold us accountable and saying, you know, if, if we're going to have you come in, this is what we recommend. And are you able to meet those metrics of having this type of food um, delivered here at CHOP? So having those metrics um, that we can identify areas to show that we have continued improvement um, in our purchasing and get in setting a goal for a certain percentage each year to be increasing is, is our next step. So Lots of lots of excitement, but also um, the work keeps going and um, open to um, helping and mentoring other institutions that are looking um, looking to have the same type of process um, within their their places. So I just want to thank you. Send it back to, to you, Matt. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so we are going to have about 15 minutes of uh, Q&A, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, I'm going to kick us off because I, I have some follow up questions, but attendees should use the Q&A function to submit their own questions and I'll start to filter those uh, to our to our panelists as well. So um, I guess one really quick thing I wanted to add is the putting the standard together, there is some terminology that can get confusing on this. So please, please, please feel free to consult really any of the folks on this webinar. If you want advice or feedback on, um, you know, what the antibiotic use standard should look like, again, CRAW, what Kathy mentioned before, is a great resource, certified responsible antibiotic use. Basically, you should only use the medically important antibiotics to treat sick animals is, is the simplest way we describe um, approved uses. Uh, so I guess first question for you, Dr. Sayud, you highlighted some of the medically <laughs> excuse me, medically important antibiotics used in food production as being particularly worrisome. Were there any classes that stood out to you as an infectious disease specialist as, whoa, 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 wait a second. I cannot believe we're using that to that extent in food animal production. Yeah, I think um, the the sheer volume of tetracyclines we use is very, is uh fairly concerning. That was one of the earliest antibiotics that were used. And of the medically relevant antibiotics, they account for more than half of the volume. Um, I think the, so part, one of the reasons that there was a little bit of discrepancy between my numbers and Tween's numbers is there's a distinction between medically relevant and non-medically relevant antibiotics. So if you just take medically relevant antibiotics as 6 million kilograms versus all comers as 10.5 million kilograms. But in my opinion, that distinction is a little bit um, uh, unimportant given how horizontal gene transfer works and how um, resistance genes are encoded and how multiple resistances can be encoded um, despite exposure to a single uh, class of antibiotics. So, uh, but yeah, tetracyclines in particular, aminoglycosides are sort of um, kind of, they're old antibiotics, but they're still sort of last resort antibiotics for resistant gram negative infections. So the fact that those are being used as well as quinolones, um, those are all highly concerning that they're being used in such large quantities. Right. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just always curious about, yeah, seeing which of the classes make infectious disease people's eyes pop out when they when they realize the extent. Um, so Dr. Metjian, you had talked about getting buy-in and you mentioned road shows. Can you tell us more about that? How did you, what, did, what, what are road shows? How did you get buy-in from people? Yeah, um, road shows are just kind of the terminology we use to go and get people, you know, go and give, you know, I had a certain bunch of slide decks of, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, why is this important, you know, who would be, you know, identifying to me, anybody at this point, you know, was really a stakeholder, because um, we all are, and um, just getting the word out there um, that this is important, because, you know, I said earlier, you know, people, you know, when you think of antimicrobial stewardship, 
um, you know, we're thinking of, you know, the inpatient and it isn't just inpatient, you know, now we know that there's regulatory requirements for outpatient stewardship. Um, so it's, it, again, still, it's not where the majority of antimicrobials are being um, prescribed. So it's, that's what I think shocked most people is when they see that, you know, that kind of that just simple pie chart of how much is really being consumed and prescribed. And, you know, we're, and we're talking about how much it's not appropriate too. So that was what the roadshow really is saying that, um, you know, we're looking for partnership, um, you know, and getting buy-in so that we could then go and, and get um, an institutional um, agreement that, you know, this is something that's important. So, um... I have another question to, to ping over to Dr. Sayed, but before I do, Kathy, you had talked about contracts. One of the things that I see as a roadblock, maybe Talleen encountered, but certainly lots of people encounter is we're under contract. What are we supposed to do? There's a, you know, a five-year contract, whatever it is. What advice would you give folks if that's what they encounter when they start to, you know, have these meetings, figure out who's the person and the person says, there's nothing you can do. We're under contract with with this supplier. Yeah, um, it's a it's an excellent question. Uh, I'm sure John might also have uh, information to to give on that. Um, and the lack of competition and consolidation in the food service management companies that that John showed on his slide is is deeply concerning. But there is a there is some competition, and so. Um, that's something to bear in mind. Those contracts do come up from renew for renewal and companies want to be on the cutting edge. And um, so there's generally, or there used to be <laughs> um, some flexibility, whether it was 5% or 10% or 20% could be bought off contract or uh, not from their mainline distributors. So um, that you have to know what that number, it does that cause exist for flexibility? What is that amount in terms Terms of the percentage of the contract, what is that amount in terms of your purchasing power, and are there restrictions in terms of the individual line items? Like John was saying, you know, it, it goes down into detail to the specific chicken breast that you're getting. So there's there are devils in those details that need to be worked out. Um, and um, there's also just if you're in a if you're in a five year contract and you're in year one and you've got four years to go, you can still start that conversation, and you can start at the institutional level the kind of work that Talene and others have done. Set your policies, change your specifications, enshrine those in the 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 policy of the institution so that when that and that takes time that's not easy and it takes time and so by the time the contract renewal rolls around you've got that set and you can give those parameters to any food service management company that is interested in your business and and begin that way and if you have the flexibility you can also, even if it's small, that's also an opportunity to be working much more locally or regionally, depending on the volume of your demand. So it may be um, a very small start, but you can begin working with producers or suppliers that are outside of the mainstream, that are smaller than the mainstream, that may be very hungry for business, that may be much more flexible and willing to work with you and excited about the possibility of working with a healthcare institution in their backyard. So that's where some exciting things can start. And those incremental baby steps that I talked about are really key because that increases your buy-in, it gets everything solidified to make the bigger systemic changes. And then the last thing I would say is really plug into things like Anchors in Action because they're wielding at the national level as best they can across all of those different sectors. Will you put this in this contract for this institution in this state, you put this in this contract, we know you can do it, do it for us. Um, and that's not a, 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 you know, it's not an, a silver bullet, but it's, it's good leverage. And so you need to have those relationships and you need to know what other people have managed to uh, negotiate in their contracts. And the collaboration and the access to those kinds of networks is one good way to get that information. John, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think, I mean, Kathy, you're 
gave a great answer. I, uh, contracts can be amended. Um, so there, you know, we, Farm to Institution New England, who is a partner of ours in um, this region of the country, they have some great resources around contracts with food service management companies, um, as well as advice around amending contracts. So it might be a good thing to share. I'm happy to send it over to you, Matt. Um, I would also say that, you know, uh, your vendors or your management companies are going to pretty much go with the status quo. They make their money through purchasing. They want, they don't really want, <laughs> well, let me preface that. There's some great work being done. There's some great individuals that I know in those companies. Um, but in terms of their business model, a lot of their money is made through these deals with um, producers. So if it's Tyson, if it's et cetera. So they're not necessarily motivated to make a lot of changes. But, um, you know, I would say they will listen to their clients. So you just have to use your voice there. And they want to keep you as a customer. And so if you make it clear to them, of course, in the contract, but in other ways, that this is a priority for your institution, they don't want to lose you as a customer. So they're, they're going to, I, I've seen a lot of great changes happen when, when their clients demand it. So that's all I would add. Yeah, that's great. So Dr. Sayud, I guess not to put the spotlight too much on you, but I, I, I will. You're just now starting this, pro you're kind of at the beginning of the, the process that Dr. Mechian finished recently. So where are you at right now with your hospital? So right now, it's still still in the process of figuring out the exact structure of purchasing here and who the sort of key players are. I've opened up some conversations with some uh, some individuals, and the encouraging part is that there's actually interest in sort of a general baseline uh, understanding that this is an issue. Um, my the main sort of obstacles have been that uh, first the complexity of just healthcare in America applies to as well to, to the food purchasing aspect as well. Um, and secondly, there isn't necessarily like uh, John alluded to a sense of urgency that this is a problem. If you look at sort of even just the few publications I mentioned, this is this is fairly catastrophic what's happening. It's not, you know, that's not really an overstatement. And um, but because the time horizons may be a little bit longer than next week, uh, there isn't necessarily an understanding at the higher levels that, 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 that this is actually catastrophic. So those have been sort of the, it's not um, the, the urgency at which these questions are pursued isn't, um, I don't think enough yet. And that just has to do with a little bit how, how early we are in the process. Um, and a little bit that has to do a little bit with um, the education that still needs to be done. Um, and then, and then, like, and then, as as everyone else has been discussing, sort of identifying exactly who who the people are who can help out the most. Yeah. Any tips from our other panelists for Dr. Sayud about how to identify those folks? I feel like you're on the right path, and don't be discouraged because um, it, it was um, I thought something that would be a, a quick blessing, you know, that, and then we can move on, you know, took over, over three years and it's, and it's still a work in, in progress to make sure we are meeting or have metrics actually now that we have this statement and we're holding to what we said we're going to do. So um, uh, every, every meeting you have is a win, if I may quote um, Dr. Weissman. So um, you're doing good work, don't give up. And, and even having this panel and knowing who's on this call, you know, reaching out and having those mentors and that support to, to keep going. Cause you know, even though as you know, I think, you know, John said something could take, you know, so long, but you have everything in place like Kathy also mentioned to have that um, change or those initiatives. And the interim, we're always educating people. Um, and it's, that's some of the feedback I've, you know, gotten is that, you know, thank you for the transparency. We didn't even know this was an issue and just seeing signage and verbiage, you know, is making other um, people ask questions and, you know, if you have an um, environmental group at your institution, I would also leverage them because they already have some systems in place for what they're doing, whether it's, you know, the recycling or even um, medical um, 
medical, um, reusing medical equipment or donating it, you know, they're, they um, were also a really helpful um, group for me um, to help pave like next steps with. Go ahead, John. I just add that a lot of these, the issues um, are interconnected. So if your facility is worried about climate change, if your facility is worried about air and water pollution, um, there might be different arguments and different or different ways to approach the topic that are going to get to the ultimate goal around here. I, what we want to do is reduce animal production and specifically raising them in CAFOs because that's why we're using antibiotics, right? So, you know, in some ways you might want to just sort of really learn your audience's motivations, right? And just um, because there are different ways to approach it, um, you know, the same, the same topic. One thing that I, I don't think came up in any of the presentations is that chicken in particular has moved in a tremendously positive direction on this issue over the last five or six years, something like nine, you know, over 90% of the U.S. chicken industry is now meeting standards that we would consider uh, responsibly used antibiotics if they're using any at all. So um, just to note that, you know, to, to Kathy's points about incremental changes, ask your institution to just serve more chicken, you know, and, and less beef and less pork, because um, that's an easy way to, uh, you know, make a difference on this issue. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, good good point, Dr. Mechia, on leverage the Antibiotic Awareness Week, which is in November. If folks don't know, it's typically the middle of November, a uh, good way to draw attention to this issue. Uh, so we have one minute left. So I guess I'll just open up to all the panelists to give very, very quick answers. Um, what are, what's your top tip for people on this call if they're a clinician or if they're working at a medical school, a public health school, and they wanna start making chains, change on this issue in their institution, what's the number one tip that you would, you would give them? And I know some of it has already been said, so maybe just restate it, but we'll do rapid fire answers all around. So Kathy, do you wanna go first? Um, people are motivated by what they care about, what they love, and what they're passionate about. So I think the first entry point is speaking, finding what speaks deeply to the person you're trying to recruit to your cause. Awesome. Dr. Metian? Um, very similar to what Kathy said. I was going to say, talk, talk, talk. Um, you know, have it as an agenda item. Um, you never know who you might be talking to that this, that this is an area or something um, that might, um, you might have a partnership with. Awesome. John? Uh, a little bit wonky, but um, don't forget about food budget. I mean, I think that a lot of people, a, a resolution is important, but it needs to be followed up with a budgetary increase. A lot of the hospitals we work with really struggle because the, the hospitals adopted amazing policies that are really positive, but then there's no budget increase for food service. Thank you for bringing us back to reality, John. Uh, Dr. Sayud, you want to close us out? Sure. For the clinicians, I guess, just remember that everything is um, connected. Basically, I think fundamentally, it's important to learn about uh, sort of the impact you everybody has. Um, and secondly, to understand that our patients don't don't necessarily under, underestimate the patients. Um, I think a lot of patients because um, especially here in St. Louis, they're um, we have a lot of socioeconomically disadvantaged patients here. The expectation is, oh, they won't care about this sort of thing. They care deeply about the food they eat, about the quality of their lives, and about the quality of their communities, um, and about about the world itself. So I feel like that gives me a lot of motivation, as well as a lot, of, you know, you know, reason to be be very um, to advocate very strongly for this kind of thing because you know more, it's all of our world, and they they want it. <laughs> and so it's our job to advocate for them, even if it's not, doesn't seem directly related to uh, clinical care, which, which in the end it is, but it, it, it you know, it's, you got to understand the bigger picture as well. That is a great way to close us out. I'll just say if folks want to learn more about what PERG's doing on this, we have a, a new coalition 
Uh, it's called the Coalition for Reserve Antibiotics that uh, I'm happy to say Dr. Sayud is, is part of. Uh, so please, and I think Dr. Metchan as well, uh, both, both are part of it. So it's clinicians, it's veterinarians, it's farmers all working together to, to solve this problem. So it's preserveantibiotics.org. Um, we'll also send that out in the follow-up email, but thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, this has been super interesting and uh, I hope our attendees got a lot out of it as well. So thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody.